So uh, with no, no more ado from me, I'm going to hand you over to uh, Steve. Uh, Steve Coburn uh, is the MD of Project 5, known to many of us. Uh, he is also an IOD Director of the Year um, winner. Um, and Steve, I'm going to hand over to you. Take it away. Okay, thank you for the uh, introduction, Richard, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm now going to share my screen. That's the window that I want to share. So, with any luck, everybody can see can see that uh, that picture of the Absolutely. new um, the <clears throat> new normal. This is um, this is how things are going to be looking for for us for quite some time now. So I'm going to talk to you about um, reopening the, the office um, and uh, what could possibly go wrong. Um, I'm talking to you um, firstly as a, uh, a fellow business owner. Um, I have an office um, at the moment that is about 5,000 square foot in size. We are actually right in the middle of fitting out our new office. So we're going to be going into something that's bigger. Um, but I've got a 5,000 square foot office and I've got 50 staff. Um, What's on the screen at the moment is just a very small uh, section of the uh, brainstorming um, that we've been doing around how can we possibly make um, getting back into the office work. I mean, there is all manner of things in there. Some of it's to do with um, how we operate as an organization. Um, and some of it is very generic around uh, you know, having magazines in your reception area. Um, or even the revised guidelines around CPR for your trained first aiders and how they do um, first aid uh, under a social distancing kind of setup. So there is a lot to consider in there, but I'm not going to be talking about any of that. Um, I'm here specifically to talk about IT. But when we get to the questions at the end, I'm more than happy to take questions on some of the wider stuff as well. Um, as an organisation, we've certainly you know, got our head around the fact that the way we work is going to change. Um, meetings can't take place uh, in the same kind of way that these meetings are taking place. Um, the way we work on our clients' PCs in the workshop, um, that needs to change completely. Um, even how we use our vans and go out on the road um, needs to change completely. Um, and we can't be taking breaks anymore on our pool table um, and sharing a queue and chalk and a cue ball and, and things like that. Luckily for us, though, we do all have our own mugs. So when it comes to making coffee, then we'll be OK um, from that side of things. Um, but what I am going to talk about is specifically the, um, the IT uh, uh, challenges around reopening an office. Um, there's a lot of things here that people may not necessarily have thought about. Um, and we want to make sure we are thinking about these ahead of time because there's some very, very simple things that you can do to head off some of these problems. Now, I'm hoping that um, with a title of we open in the office that most of the um, the 50 participants on this um, uh, meeting are people responsible for offices um, and hopefully with an interest in IT. Um, certainly the first few uh, bullet points on here are going to be very specific to um, offices and IT. Um, however, when I get to the um, second from last one, the working from home, I think if you don't have an office and you are someone who's um, working from home, I think there's going to be a lot we can cover in that section that will be relevant to those sort of more smaller businesses and consultants who are working from home as well, because I can see a lot of changes coming around how working from home um, operates going forwards. So let's crack on. We've, um, I haven't got too long on this one. Um, I want to get to the point so we can have some questions and discussions at the end. Um, that probably means I'm going to go through some of these slides quite quickly, um, but I'm conscious it's IT. So um, um, yeah, we can't really get into too much detail on it. Right. So social distancing. What do we need to think about when it comes to social distancing um, from an IT perspective? Well, obviously getting the, um, the office set up uh, for reopening um, could require people to move computers around, swapping them to a new desk and spreading staff about. Um, you don't want to be doing that on the day that all the staff turn up in the morning. Um, there's a lot of people who are going to be putting in uh, desk dividers, um, perspex or glass or even solid desk dividers. Um, and the way a lot of desks are cabled at the moment, um, with cables moving from one desk to another, that's going to be very difficult to achieve um, without some, uh, an element of uh, purchasing new cables, longer cables, or, or reconfiguring how those desks are set up. Um, there's going to be the need to move desks around. Um, we're going to need to uh, get rid of some of the desks, space some of them out, and things like that. 
when we've done that, that's obviously going to have an impact on where the floor boxes are. Um, so all the floor boxes in the office may need to be moved. We don't want cables draping across a walkway um, and things like that. And once we've finished doing all the physical moves, making sure all of the IT is plugged back in again and tested, um, we need to get our people back and start doing updated DSE assessments um, to make sure that the screens um, and the posture and the seats and the desks and everything else uh, meet those kind of required standards. That's the physical stuff around uh, social distancing. Um, moving on to some of the um, IT related things, um, you need to expect when you go back into the office that there's going to be a fair amount of IT problems that you're going to encounter when you first get there. Um, for a start, uh, a lot of people would have changed their password um, or their password would have been updated whilst they were working from home. When they return to their desktop, their desktop will have the password that was um, set last time they were in, which may be several months ago. Um, they may not even remember what their password is. So you need to make sure that your um, IT team are geared up for handling all of the um, password resets that are gonna be required when people start to um, turn up at the office. Um, the other thing you may notice is that uh, antivirus programs, especially on desktops where desktops have been switched off for a long time, they may have lost their heartbeat connection to the update server. Um, so you might uh, be in a position where your workstations are not updating themselves with the latest antivirus updates and you need your IT team to, um, to reconnect them and get them set up again. Uh, and finally, um, Windows PCs, if they are left off for too long, um, the, they will deactivate themselves. So you might find yourself with a, a whole raft of challenges there around the licensing and needing to uh, reactivate um, a, whole, a whole whole set of your desktops. So those are the, um, the kind of problems we expect from a login and security point of view when people get back to the office. Um, the next one we need to consider is bandwidth. So imagine turning on 50, 100 PCs that have not been turned on for four, five, six months. Um, there's going to be an awful lot of Windows updates that need to be downloaded. Um, for a start, you need to make sure that those updates are applied uh, and all those vulnerabilities patched. But secondly, the bandwidth use um, on the office as all of those PCs start to download their updates um, could be quite significant. Windows updates aren't going to be the only thing though that uh, affect the bandwidth. Um, if everybody turns on their Outlook um, and they have to update three, four, five months worth of um, email um, traffic across all of their folders. Um, this uh, screenshot here shows the, um, the, the famous um, uh, phrase in Outlook of all folders are up to date connected to Microsoft Exchange. Uh, it may be some time when people um, first turn on their computers before it says all folders are up to date. It will be synchronizing all of the folders and all of the, um, the data in the background. Um, that's gonna have a, a massive impact on bandwidth. The other thing that is also going to happen is when you start to use Outlook again on your desktop computers, your search indexes will be out of date. So all of the work that you've done in the last four months when you want to search for an email, um, search for a conversation that you've been having, it may take several days, maybe even weeks before the search indexes update themselves enough that you're finding all of the emails that relate to the last four months. And finally, those icons in the bottom right hand corner. Um, I've got uh, icons there for Dropbox and uh, OneDrive Personal, OneDrive Business. So all of those things need to synchronize themselves again. If you've got people who are synchronizing um, uh, data down to their desktops, arguably they shouldn't really be doing that. But if they are, all of that lot needs to be um, updated as well. And that's gonna have a big impact on the bandwidth usage in the office. Okay, moving on to the next section now of uh, video meetings. So a number of things to consider when it comes to video meetings. Um, if you remember back, I mean, for me, it was 75 days ago, I think now, when I first started working from home, um, everything has changed in how I've set up my desk. Um, I first started uh, doing video meetings using my laptop. Um, the webcam was down there. I had a very funny angle. There was a lot of pictures of the ceiling behind me. Um, I moved the uh, laptop up onto a box. Um, I then started using my iPad. I then bought myself a nice um, HD webcam, which is uh, rather delicately balanced on an upside down champagne flute um, to put it right in the middle of my twin screens on my desktop here. 
all of this lot has taken me several weeks of uh, trial and error um, to sort out and uh, get something that I'm happy with. And I now have a, a decent webcam, I now have decent speakers, I can uh, join into video meetings very, very effectively. Um, and as you can see from my background, I'm lucky enough not to be working from the kitchen table. Um, I have my own study, um, which means that it's very easy for me to conduct um, the business uh, of Project 5 with a dozen, 14, 15 different video meetings back to back during the course of a day. Um, as soon as I go into the office though, that's gonna be very different. Um, all of a sudden we're now in an open plan office. Um, and if all of us are having video meetings in the open plan office, then the noise is going to be quite considerable. Um, we are going to, uh, we're gonna find that we do need to continue to have those video meetings because there will be a lot of people not returning to work from our own team because they're still shielding or for other reasons are working from home. Our supply chain and our customers are now used to video meetings. So the use of video meetings will increase and we're not going to do that very easily in our open plan office. It's going to have an impact on, uh, on bandwidth as well. Um, if you think about um, your internet speeds, um, I'm lucky enough that that's my internet speed at home. Uh, I did a test this morning, um, getting over 217 megabits uh, download speed. Um, for a lot of offices, they won't be anywhere near that. And if you think about how things are working at the moment with homeschooling, working with your partner at home, um, trying to alternate the use of uh, Fortnite and, uh, and video meetings and all the stuff that a general family is going to be doing at home, eating into that bandwidth, what's it going to be like when you have 50 staff back in the office and they're all now using video meetings along with everything else? Do you actually have um, enough bandwidth on your internet connection to make it work properly um, in an office environment? Webcams, I'll go back to the, um, the picture I showed you before. Um, all of those twin screens there, and none of those have webcams on them. So uh, if we're gonna go back to uh, desktops and, and those kind of setups, um, how are we going to handle doing video meetings? Um, background, well, um, my background here is uh, a whole bunch of CDs that wasn't done intentionally. This was actually the way my study was set up and it wasn't set up with video meetings in mind. But in the office, there's going to be an awful lot of information um, on the walls, whiteboards. Um, you might have all manner of things um, scribbled up over the wall that you don't want people to see. You need to be very wary of what your background is. Um, a lot of people use the um, uh, blurred background um, setting or will use a virtual background to hide some of the, um, the security uh, and uh, password uh, clues that may be in the background. Um, I did a video on this one uh, a couple of weeks ago um, where I pointed to having my dog running around and all of my hobbies and all of the things that you can see in the background that will give you very strong clues as to what type of person I am um, and therefore what type of password I may have. But in the office environment where you've got a whiteboard, you might actually have something written on that whiteboard. Um, so you need to be very careful about what you're sharing in your backgrounds. Um, headphones. So um, we need to... Uh, get headphones for everybody with microphones so that they can start to do uh, those video meetings. Um, I'm not using a headphone set at home because I've got my own study, but in that open plan office, um, it's gonna be hard enough with everybody doing their video meetings as it is without having all of the uh, people at the other end of the video meetings blaring out of uh, speakers, um, some of which may be on the desktop itself, which might be under the desk and, and very difficult to hear. So have you purchased enough headphones for everybody to continue to use video meetings? Um, and your meeting rooms, what do your meeting rooms um, look like? Are they set up um, ready for video conferencing? Um, are you able to, um, to seat enough people socially distanced around a table to have a, um, a video meeting? Um, do you have a professional um, green screen background for when you want to? What is gonna be in the background? Uh, have you got bright window lights behind you? There is actually specialist paint um, for video uh, conferencing suites um, in large offices um, that brings out the skin tone um, best with people and manages the lighting and things like that. So if you're gonna to move to um, video meetings more professionally, uh, what do your meeting rooms look like? And do you have enough of them um, for you to be able to hold internal meetings and video meetings um, with all the clients and, and supply chain that you work with? Uh, and finally, um, security. Um, this is uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, this is the guy who wrote Facebook. If you have a look at his um, Mac there that he's got on his desk, he's done two things there. 
he's put a bit of tape over the microphone and he's put a bit of tape over the webcam. He knows the reason why he's done that. Um, if we start opening up uh, webcams and microphones and everything across our corporate network, what else do we need to um, be wary of from a uh, security and uh, privacy point of view? Um, so be aware of that one. Okay, so now uh, moving on to um, working from home. Um, for all of those people who are working from home, um, the, there's a number of things to cover here. Um, and the first one I'm going to talk about is our, our good friend GDPR. Um, I know as we um, exit the, uh, the EU, um, we will still be bound by GDPR for um, all of the, the uh, personal identifiable data for EU citizens that we hold. But as a third country, uh, it will be the Data Protection Bill, which is basically the um, GDPR um, plus, plus, plus. We've added extra stuff over here in the UK to it. Um, so we're going to be bound by these kind of regulations going forwards. And it's the Information Commissioner's Office or the ICO's job to enforce um, the uh, GDPR or Data Protection Bill standards. They've been very good um, as we've uh, headed off home. This is a, a long um, statement here from the um, Information Commissioner. Uh, you don't need to read it all, but if you want to, I will be sending links out um, via Richard at the end to all of these ICO pages so you can look at the information that's on there. Um, but I think what's really important about the ICO at the moment um, is that they have recognised that uh, public health um, comes above the uh, privacy of data. So they have been uh, very, they publicly said they're going to be very lenient um, on any sort of uh, breaches at the moment or any of the uh, guidelines that we need to adhere to because what they wanted was everybody to go home and start working from home as quickly as possible. Once offices start to reopen though, um, and um, working from home becomes a choice, uh, not a requirement from the government, then the ICO are not, are going, not going to have so uh, relaxed rules anymore. So we are going to need to be wary of some of the things that the ICO require us to do um, and make sure we are on top of those. Um, the ICO define, so GDPR um, defines that you need to have appropriate security measures in your business. Um, the ICO over here in the UK uh, further define appropriate security measures as at least the basic minimum of Cyber Essentials certification ready. Cyber Essentials certification has been around for a, a long time. Um, every uh, business in the UK um, according to GDPR, according to the ICO, should be at the standard that would enable them to be Cyber Essential certified. They're not going the full hulk and saying you have to be certified because they run a monopoly. These are the guys that do the certification. They just say you have to be at that standard. You can go onto the um, uh, uh, Cyber Essentials website and you can search for any organization and see if they have actually registered and certified themselves as Cyber Essential certified. Um, there's our registration there. You should be doing that for your customers, your suppliers. You should be doing that for yourself. As I said, you don't need to be legally certified, but you need to be at the standard. And for the small amount of money it costs to get you actually certified, why not do it? Well, Cyber Central certification has been around for a while. Uh, we've been helping clients get Cyber Central certified for a long time. Um, but Cyber Central certifier, certified status um, means there's various things that you can't do one of which is you should not be an administrator of your own PC. Um, this is one of the slides that I've taken from my cybercrime awareness training um, course. And I think the middle bullet point there is, is really interesting. 99.5% of all vulnerabilities in Internet Explorer could have been mitigated if the person had have logged on using a user account, not an admin account. We're not talking 20%, we're not talking 50%, we're talking 99.5% of all vulnerabilities would have been mitigated if you'd have logged on as a user account. Now we all know what happens. Um, we go to the uh, we go to PC World, we go to Amazon, we buy a PC, we turn it on, we set up a user account, and that's our home PC. Well, that first user account that you've set up is an administrator account. And a lot of people have gone home now and have started using their home PC, logged in as an administrator, and are exposing themselves to these kind of risks. So that brings me on to what do you do from a PC point of view? Do you have a company PC uh, or do you have a home PC? Um, this is lifted straight off of the ICO website. I um, mean, some things to consider. There are further links and further documents that you can follow. They are talking about the different ways that you can do stuff. You can use a company issued device 
Um, you can bring your laptop home from the organization you work for, and it can be set up with all of the security, firewalls, administrative privileges, everything that you need, um, and you can use that. It's expensive to do if you want everyone in your organization to have a company owned device at home. Um, but I see a lot of organizations at the moment um, buying more and more laptops and moving in that direction. Alternatively, you could use your home device, um, but install company software on it. Um, if you're going to do that, then set up multi-factor authentication. Um, make sure you have a separate user account so that your family can't uh, log on and use that account that is kept separate from your personal data. Um, there's all these kind of things that you um, you need to do. Um, and also consider the fact that using company software is important because a lot of the software software that we have on our home PCs is not for commercial use. So it's a good idea to have uh, company software on there. Um, all these people who are using WhatsApp in business, um, WhatsApp are now going after people because uh, WhatsApp is not for uh, business use, it's for personal use only. So be wary of, uh, of using um, software on people's home PCs uh, that isn't company software. Um, but if you do go down the use of uh, having your own device, there's an awful lot more there that you need to consider. If you, your staff, your employees are using their home device, um, there's a lot of guidance that the um, ICO have issued around how to try and protect um, the data, the company data that is on those PCs. Moving on um, from that, once you've got a uh, PC that's secure, what about your home network? Um, well, I've um, uh, exposed the uh, a portal here of our home network, so you can see some of the devices that we have on our home network. Now, obviously, the top eight up there, uh, I didn't need to show those because those are Windows PCs, they're Mac PCs, they're iPads, they're things that are relatively secure. What I want to draw your attention to is some of the stuff that's on our network that's a lot further down. Um, we've got uh, um, Skyboxes, we've got Xboxes, we've got the Virgin Media Box, now TV Box. Um, I am going to fess up, um, my barbecue is internet connected um, and even my, even my toothbrush is internet connected and controlled from an app on my phone. So I am a bit of a geek when it comes to that. But I've got a whole raft of things in here, um, none of which are patched, all using um, uh, open source um, software. Um, one I'll just pick on here is the um, Wi-Fi enabled um, uh, light bulb that is above my head in my study here. So there's details there about the type of operating system it has. Um, since I have installed it, I have never patched it. I've never updated it. I have no idea what security loopholes are in it. Um, and that's the usage for the last um, 24 hours of that light bulb. Now, it's not a lot of usage, but this is through our network. This is through the router out onto the internet. You can see that at uh, six o'clock, seven o'clock this morning, there was a sharp rise in the amount of traffic that this light bulb was um, having uh, on the internet. Now, it, it's not gonna affect our bandwidth. The um, scan on the left are, are bytes, not kilobytes or megabytes, um, bits, sorry. Um, but uh, it is still communicating. So is it a good idea that um, we go home with our work PCs and plug them onto the same network where we've got all of this rubbish um, on there. In the office, if you want to be Cyber Central certified, any device on your corporate network has to be patched with the latest security updates within three weeks of that patch being released by the manufacturer. Um, and I know uh, for a fact that we've been setting up people um, on their home routers um, that will be BT routers that have been around for four years that have never been patched, have no firewall on them, um, and may even have the uh, default admin password on them. The ICO has said that's okay at the moment, um, but there will come a time when that needs to be addressed, um, and they will circle back and we'll need to, meet, need to make sure that all this homework in, um, is set up correctly. One of the things you could consider, um, and I've got it at home, is a VLAN. So I actually, my work computer um, is on a completely separate network to those light bulbs and everything else. Um, it means I can use my uh, one of the VLANs or virtual um, networks and I can control the light bulbs of Alexa and all that kind of stuff. I need to be careful about saying Alexa because she'll wake up and stop talking to me now. Um, but I can, I can do all that lot on my home network, um, but where my PC is plugged in that I do my work on, it's on a completely separate network, completely um, divorced from the, um, the home setup. So 
We don't know yet, but the ICO might consider that that's an appropriate setup. We need to watch for the guidelines um, as we come out of uh, lockdown. Um, there's a number of different ways you can consider connecting to uh, company resources. Um, I don't want to go too technical on this one, but you could open a virtual private network or a VPN connection back into your office and effectively put your PC onto the, um, the office network and access the resources directly off of that. Um, you could have all of your data in the cloud and you can access it from the cloud, um, ideally using multi-factor authentication. Um, or you could be using a remote desktop and you could be taking remote control of a desktop that's either in your offices um, or one of the things we're doing a lot of at the moment is we are setting up a whole series of uh, Azure um, cloud-based desktops um, which are permanently connected via a VPN back into a company office um, and when people want to remote work they use their home device to take remote control of the cloud-based desktop um, so that everything is secure, everything is patched um, and they can get back in to access company data that way. So talk to your IT team about the type of connection that you're going to use from home and use something that's appropriate for your business. Um, and finally, um, when you're at home, uh, you still are bound by the DSE assessment. So you need to be making sure um, that the workstation is set up correctly. That's why I've got twin screens in front of me and that's why my webcam is uh, balanced on the um, upside down uh, champagne flute in front of me because to sit all day doing this over hunched over a laptop is not very good from a DSE point of view. So these are all the things that we're going to need to really watch out for as we start to come out of um, a lockdown. Um, I think home working has been fantastic seeing the way that organisations have adapted to it. I think organisations have been very, very flexible um, in allowing and getting home working set up as quickly as they have. Um, but I think as we start to come out of it, what we would have done is we'd have shone a spotlight on what home working actually looks like and, and how, I normally use the word insecure, but I know that's emotional, isn't it? It's not insecure, how non-secure um, a home network and home working can be. Um, so I expect that we will see more coming out from the ICO with stricter guidelines around how we secure our home networks in the future. That's all the slides from me. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so we can go back. There we go. So thank you so much, Steve. Excellent, well done. And um, a lot of very useful uh, information um, shared there, both from a sort of working from home and a working in the office and uh, migrating back to the office perspective. And um, I, I know that everyone's going to have some questions. There's, there's, um, there's a question at the moment that is um, on, the, on the chat. And um, let's have a look and see where that's from. That's from Rob, Rob Smythe. Yep. And, and Rob, can you just art articulate that and then everyone else well, can be thinking about what they want to ask? Sure. Firstly, Steve, there's a fantastic presentation covering loads of areas I hadn't even considered. But one point I did focus on was a point that in the future we'll be operating on video conferencing. And you, like many other people, whether politicians or whoever on the television, they're exposing things in their background they don't even think about. And, and some of the politicians have exposed themselves you know, quite badly. So uh, the presentation I wanted to share, uh, which I can send to you, perhaps, uh, Richard, for on, onward uh, um, transmission, is... Um, it was an Institute of Chartered Accountants uh, interview with a woman who has spent 30 years in TV and media, all about presentation techniques, going from backgrounds to how you dressed, how you position the camera, how you say things. And it was really quite enlightening. And it's something I've been through two or three times. I've shared it with a number of other business groups as well. Uh, and I'm more than happy to share it with well, amongst ourselves because we're going to have to learn these new different ways of doing things. And also with backgrounds, for example, the background I'm using at the moment was downloaded from a site called unsplash.com, where you can get any sort of backgrounds you want to set the sort of mood of the meeting you're in. So you see I've chosen something that's totally uncluttered. People, when they're talking to me, they're not looking at what books you're reading on the background, who's that's a picture of, why is that bookshelf so messy? All those sort of things which distract from conveying message. So I'll just stop there and just say, if I can share that presentation with you, it's definitely worth looking at. Yeah, um, give, me, give me the link. You, you can put it up onto the chat area as well, Rob. 
the, the thing, of course, with chat is that um, once the meeting goes, the, the chat goes. I keep the chat because I'm running the meeting. But um, yeah, it's not a link as such because the email that came from the institute just has a, a link built in there, so I can if I can extract I, I that out. to me. And Polly and I will will yeah. get it out okay. to people on okay. on the call. Right. Thank um, you. Cool. Thank you. Okay. So, any other any other questions coming through there? Um, I'll I'll be asking you guys, um, you know, sort of to to keep your questions coming. Um, open up your mic if you will. But in the meantime, um, I just want to check with you, Steve, about the the, the syncing um, of you know your personal laptop when you're sort of working uh, from home, and then that sort of non-synced stuff that's back at the the office desktop I mean is that not are you suggesting that's not been run automatically whilst people have been away from the office um, yes I think what, what's happening is um, those desktops will of course be turned off um, so all of those updates the synchronizing in Outlook um, the Windows updates and the synchronizing of data in uh, Dropbox and OneDrive and Microsoft Teams SharePoint all that kind of stuff can't synchronize to a desktop that's turned off um, I would argue that um, you know, when it comes to that kind of synchronization, um, there's a better way of setting up um, access to data in OneDrive, um, SharePoint and uh, Dropbox that doesn't rely on you having to synchronize everything um, because that does uh, eat into a lot of people's bandwidth. When one person in the office shares, saves something, it uploads and then downloads to everyone else's PCs. Um, there's much better ways of setting it up. But no, um, you, you, if the desktops are in the office and turned off, um, then they will be uh, not receiving any updates or any synchronized data. So um, we're making sure when we're talking to our clients that they uh, inform us when they're going to start to reopen the office. Um, and we make sure we've got engineers who can go to site um, in the week before the offices reopen. Um, and uh, we can start to turn on all those, um, those desktops and start to turn on all the IT equipment um, and make sure that all those updates and synchronizations have all taken place. Uh, before the users start to turn up. Uh, absolutely, and you know, um, probably most offices wouldn't have um, sort of lone workers um, sort of going into the office and, and doing that stuff necessarily. Um, and and even if even if they do have um, lone workers and meet with the HSE requirements around lone working um, for a particular um, aspect of work, uh, it might not be the IT person. Uh, who will be doing that? So I think that's 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 something very important for all, all our, our members and friends who are operating from an office and currently operating from home to consider um, that immediate load um, on the infrastructure uh, without uh, without a lot of uh, preparation beforehand. Mm -hmm. So we've got Bruce. Bruce, do you want to sort of uh, th throw your question into the room? Yeah, sure. Um, so one that's, uh, as a lot of you know, I'm in the IT sector as well. And uh, one thing that's been going through my head is uh, what we're going to do with our clients with all the office-based PC equipment they have. So the government advice, as far as I'm aware, is that they're, they're going to advise people to be disinfecting their offices. And uh, um, but certainly, as far as I'm aware, PC, keyboards, mice, monitors, you know, the things that people touch, they don't really respond that well to disinfection. So uh, what are we, what, at a practical level, we're going to do about that. I was wondering what Steve's thoughts on it were. Yeah, and, and it's an interesting question because I think um, it also affects um, uh, you know, yourself and us as well when we send engineers out there. Um, you know, we could be in a position where um, in the office at the moment, my finance director um, has a desktop PC. Um, she's working from the office because um, she's dealing with all of the uh, deliveries and everything that's, that are coming in and out of the office. Um, and no one else uses her PC, so it doesn't matter quite so much because it's her keyboard, her mouse. Um, but in uh, areas where people do swap around and change and use each other's PCs, then um, that is going to be very difficult to make sure those PCs are properly cleaned and disinfected. And um, for our own team, it's something we need to be aware of and make sure we can get hold of enough um, you know, to use the phrase PPE equipment, but you know, disposable gloves and things like that. So that if a field support engineer is having to actually go to site and sit at a user's desk and uh, diagnose a problem um, on site, then um, they are wearing gloves that they then dispose of immediately afterwards 
um, to avoid sort of transference um, from one keyboard to another to another. So it is something I think is going to be interesting. And I think I think the people who make laptops are absolutely loving this yeah. um, because I think we're going to end up getting into a position where everybody has a, uh, a device um, that is theirs. Um, I see a lot about um, people debating whether hot desking is, is finished or whether actually hot desking is the answer. I think if we're having to keep socially distant from people, um, have people working at home, working in the office to give everybody a permanent desk starts to become hugely inefficient, um, creates a very uh, stagnant mood in the office and is uh, yeah, very expensive. Hot desking is the way to go when it comes to that one. But what you need to do is find a way to make sure the hot desk is treated the same way as a table in Starbucks is, um, in that there's no shared um, stuff on it that uh, you can get transference from one user to another. And when somebody vacates the hot desk, there is um, somebody standing around with a squeegee bottle and a, and a, um, a cloth and they can clean the hot desk down, uh, ready for the next person to join it. Um, so yeah, I, I think laptops um, are going to be the way that uh, a lot of businesses go. And I think the challenge, of course, on this one is that um, nobody really knows how long this is going to be around for. Are we talking about putting in place measures that help us get through the next three to six months, in which case we're just going to stay carrying on working from home? Um, or are we talking about things that are going to be affecting us for the next 18 months? Um, or is this going to be something that affects us now for the rest of our lives? Are we always going to have to find some way to um, manage around this? So um, it's going to be an interesting one, seeing how that, uh, how that plays out. Uh, absolutely, Stephen. And the, the, the question around hot, hot desking, um, you know, which was a, a solution to maximizing office space, um, you know, the, a number of people who I, who I know are working in hot desk environments where people go in, get their, get their work laptop out of the, out of the locker and, and find a place to work. Um, they're, they're going, they're having to do quite serious regimes around um, making that hot desk area um, safe in inverted commas, because of course somebody could be going into an office, finding a hot desk, um, working away and then sort of pulling away at, um, you know, at short notice. Um, and um, because it's available and free, somebody else might want to jump on top of it. So, um, yeah. you know, how, how do you, how do you sort of manage that transfer? Uh, because of course the business is responsible for creating that safe, safe environment um, to be, to be sort of compliant. So the hot desking think, thing, I think, is going to be a big challenge for, for a lot of businesses, as is even things like going to the toilet. I mean, yeah. let's be honest, it's going to be, there's going to be a challenge. There's going to be a challenge around this stuff. Yeah, I think the other thing as well, moving on from hot desk, is uh, meeting rooms and audio visual in, uh, in meeting rooms. Um, and I think that's going to be an interesting one, um, because how many meeting rooms are set up with a PC in there, you know, cables and, and people sharing the, uh, the use of the audio visual in a meeting room. Um, in our new office, we uh, made a bit of foresight. I can't claim credit for it. It's a complete accident. But in our new office, um, all of our meeting rooms are set up to use Alexa for business. Um, so actually everything that you want to do in a meeting room is done by asking Alexa to turn the screen on, ask Alexa to get you connected to a Zoom call, um, ask Alexa to dim the lights, all of that kind of stuff. So everything's voice controlled um, in the meeting rooms. Um, oh but I think that's going to be something we'll see an awful lot more of. Yeah. Um, you know, using that kind of voice control for, for things. That might well be a, a good way forward. Yeah. Um, less hands on stuff, um, you know, that has to be shared, the better. Um, Ro Roger Kimber's asked a, an interesting question. It's sort of tangential, maybe to something that I spoke about earlier on. Roger, do you want to share away? Hi, Richard. Hi, everyone else. Um, yeah, I, I do think this is a, an opportunity where, um, you know, everyone should be um, thinking about the way their networks are set up. Uh, I think we've been quite lucky with like Steve, uh, we've been quite IT savvy for a while. So all our data is stored on, on a network, which is backed up uh, daily uh, to a cloud and uh, everyone accesses that through a VPN. So no one's storing any files. There's no syncing having to be done. Uh, we also manage all of our uh, laptops or, or desktop devices with using a management console to ensure that um, uh, patches are rolled out, as Steve said, within the uh, ideally within the three week window. Once we've made sure that those patches are not going to cause any problems to the software that we are, are running, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to uh, for our sort of design teams or our business management system. 
So I think we've been quite lucky in that we're, we're quite well organized uh, to work remotely, but I appreciate lots of other businesses haven't considered this. And uh, I do think that people should maybe fundamentally review from, from scratch how they, should, how they should run their, uh, their networks and how they can ensure that people can um, work effectively remotely without all these issues that Steve has uh, very uh, carefully uh, laid out to us. Mm. So, yeah, so, 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 so the question I think, Steve, is, you know, if you've got stuff stored up on that, on, on a network, um, do you still have the problem with local machines that, that are going to be turned on? So I think, I think there's a, a lot to, um, to cover there, because what you've, you've basically come back to is um, one of the, um, the root sort of IT strategic questions um, around the infrastructure that you're going to have set up. Um, there are advantages to having the network. There are advantages to having everything stored on the network. Um, one of the disadvantages um, would be, so you, you've, Roger, you've, you've, um, you've nicely articulated a lot of the advantages there. One of the disadvantages, of course, is that for that remote working, you have to open up a VPN connection. So how are you going to open a VPN connection into that network where all that data is stored? How yeah. do you manage bandwidth in and out of the office? And if you're opening that VPN connection, from a uh, unsecured device, a home user device or things like that, you're effectively allowing um, those kind of devices onto your, your home network, obviously with extra security around it. Um, but I think there's, um, there's an awful lot to consider and there isn't a right or wrong answer that um, as an IT person, I can turn around and say, this is the way you should be doing it. We go through an enormous uh, um, amount of effort talking to our customers about their business, um, analyzing, all of the throughput of their data, um, connectivity speeds, bandwidth utilization, all that kind of stuff to really come up with the right solution for them as to whether it's better to have data on the network, have it in the cloud, use remote desktop, um, use um, a cloud uh, tool like um, Office 365 and Teams um, to store data. So there's, a, there's an enormous number of, um, of different ways of approaching it and every single one of them will have um, a benefit um, that will protect you from one thing. Yeah, um, you're right. For every, you every, uh, every solution, there's 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 a risk, isn't there? Yeah, uh, that, that that's IT for you. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, we only allow um, we only allow uh, hardware to connect through VPN. That's obviously uh, company authorized. So we don't let anyone use any devices <coughs> or their home devices to connect through the VPN. But yeah, as you say, I suppose the other the other issue of VPNing is, of course, if all your data is on the network and you do have a network dropout suddenly you don't have any access to your, your data. Um, yeah. So obviously that can cause a, a problem in, in, in that sense. Um, what I, I think maybe one thing to highlight um, is, you know, um, we all look at uh, download bandwidth, um, which, is, which is important, but what's actually more important if you're running remotely or trying to access data is upload yeah. from your server back to you. That can be the actual stumbling block. If lots of people are trying to access data on your network at once, that server is trying to push data up the connection and the connection is probably about a tenth up speed as it is down speed. Uh, so uh, maybe that's something you should think about if you're looking at a data network, um, like a, a broadband package, it's the upload speed that you want to think about necessarily, not the download speed. Yeah, absolutely. Upload is, is very important because that becomes your bottleneck. And that's why a lot of businesses are using are moving away from broadband as their type of connection, uh, going for a, um, a lease line um, or fiber mm. connection where um, the bandwidth is the same in both directions. We, we when this um, all kicked off, we looked at that, but unfortunately, the timing was just you know it wasn't going to happen. So um, we did yeah. boost our, our broadband uh, connection, and we got it through in about a week after after the shutdown. But uh, yeah, we did look at the, the lease line option. I must admit. Yeah. Cool. There's a couple of um, interesting questions, um, Richard, from uh, Emily Gibson. Um, she's asked a question about uh, Cyber Central standards and is that something that individual consultants should be working towards? Um, and the other one she's asked is around, um, are there any disadvantages to using cloud as your main or only form of storage? So I think, I've, if you don't mind, I'll answer those two because I think they could be quite useful to a lot of the people on the call. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, the, the, the challenge around cyber central standards is, um, I go back to using the, the, the exact words and I'll quote it again from the ICO, um, you should use appropriate security measures. And every time I speak to the ICO and say, is this technology appropriate? They say, speak to your IT company. And I say, I am the IT company, is this appropriate? And they say, oh, don't know. Um, so it's very difficult to get a straight answer from them. The, the, the most straight answer we've ever got from them and it is written in, there, in, in the law, it's written in the guidance, is you should be at least the basic minimum of Cyber Essentials certification ready. 
So I think, yes, from a, an individual consultant in business, you should be aiming to be Cyber Central certified. Um, where it makes it slightly difficult is that the, um, the, the individual consultant working from home may have a different set of standards to what you could do um, for a larger business um, that would have to do something different. So there is some ambiguity in how you get Cyber Central certified. The ICO have done something to resolve that um, in that there were six different certification bodies that could get you uh, Cyber Central certified. Um, we worked with a, an organization, um, a very large charity around the beginning of the year um, and um, the way they were set up, they would not get certified through three of those bodies, but the other three would have certified them. Um, our advice was, well, let's solve these problems. And they said, no, let's use one of the three that will pass us. Um, what actually happened in April is five of those bodies are now no longer able to certify and there's only one body remaining. Um, so we're waiting to see what that one body comes out with um, and how they define those kind of security measures under Cyber Essentials. So I think there's gonna be an awful lot of movement um, in this over the course of the next year. One of the things that the body that's remained, that they're called IASME, um, I-A-S-M-E, um, they won't allow you to take a mobile phone out of scope, um, which makes it very difficult then to, um, you actually have to manage that mobile phone with mobile device management and stuff like that. So I, I think this, this COVID-19, this enforced lockdown has shone a spotlight on something where there's a lot of ambiguity. And I think in the next 18 months, we'll see an awful lot more clarification coming from the ICO over what businesses should and shouldn't do. But I think if you were a lawyer arguing this one, you would say, yes, based on what it says, you should be Cyber Central certification standards. Um, so that's and, the Cyber Central and in any side. Event, Steve, it's, in any event, Steve, it, it will be, you know, and, I, and I'm not, but, but in any event, it will, you know, I, I, I am thinking I'm gonna put, put it down there, you know, it, it would be good practice anyway, wouldn't it? I mean, at yeah. least to be aware of, of what, what is required and, and, and try to meet as much as possible, if not all, yeah. of those standards for, for, for your own business. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I take you back to that slide I showed that 99.5% of all vulnerabilities in Internet Explorer would have been mitigated if you were logged in as a user, not an admin. Yeah. How many consultants working from home on their own laptop are admins of their own machines? Mm -hmm. If you can install a piece of software on your laptop without having to put an elevated administrator password in, then you are an admin of your own machine. Mm -hmm. So it's not about necessarily your compliance with the law. It's about protecting you from those very simple, basic risks. Yeah, so, yeah. I remember you. I remember you sharing that that with 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 me um, a n number of years ago, Steve, because I was complaining about about having to log in twice to make any changes, and you said, "Well, why wouldn't you?" You yeah. know, uh, you know. So uh, if if anybody out there has got can log onto their machine and download software willy nilly, then think about the risk that you're carrying on that. Yeah. Uh, could I, could I, could I um, sort of jump in and ask Paul, because um, uh, we've also had somebody uh, reinforcing Paul's, Paul Hopwood's question. Uh, Paul, do you want to throw your question about uh, service engineers? Yeah, happy to. Um, uh, without wanting to stereotype, um, <clears throat> computer techies and personal hygiene don't always go together. And I was wondering what, um, what things uh, people are putting in place where... Steve, you said a lot of your engineers could go to the office before everyone else, turn on the machines, and obviously they're touching everything um, IT in an office. Are they having PPE? Um, are they using disinfectant? You know, how is that? How is that kind of working? Yeah, so um, we are working on it, and we are um, like every business having to make uh, risk-based decisions on this one um, because um, the guidelines aren't one hundred percent clear. Yes, uh, we've got um, the hand sanitizer. We are um, pushing the, um, the government guidelines around washing hands and that kind of stuff. We are looking about whether or not people want to wear branded um, face masks that match their orange um, Project 5 t-shirts. Um, but we, what we're having to put in place, of course, is that it's our responsibility as a employer to make sure we complete that COVID-19 um, risk assessment of our office but also that we educate all of our field service engineers so that they can recognize whether the office they're about to walk into also meets those standards. And if it doesn't, then they are allowed to come away and say, we don't want to work there. 
um, we don't you know we don't feel safe in that kind of environment um, we've got 50 staff we've got people who are um, really blase about this they just they just don't think anything is going to get them and they they're happy to go out and do as many calls as they can uh, we've got other people who um, have partners who are um, in that uh, high risk category they are shielding um, and we're having to uh, protect them so we're having to take advantage uh, um, take measures really to to really help a, a broad spectrum of people's feelings and, and personal views um, about the current situation that we're in and be as human as possible in supporting every single one of them um, but it is difficult you know, we, there isn't there isn't hard and fast guidelines of what we are and aren't allowed to do mm. So I was thinking more about customers than than staff necessarily. Obviously, you've got to look after your staff. I realise that. But, mm. Yeah, and it's just, it's the same, I guess, for customers. It, you know, what we 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 did some on-site uh, work um, a few weeks back where we installed, we fitted out the, the all of the meeting rooms in this solicitors firm um, with really nice, quite expensive um, uh, video uh, meeting units from Logitech. They're, you know, over a thousand pounds each. They were really really nice, and um, we went down there to set it all up. Uh, and when we went down there, the entire organisation was working. Um, everyone had their own office. Um, they were like, no, it's all absolutely fine. We, you know, we don't care. Um, just crack on, drill the holes in the walls, get the stuff sorted and get out. Um, you go to other places and they're literally, they're standing by the door to squirt you with, with um, alcohol gel as you come in. Um, and um, every organisation is slightly different. So we have to be careful to make sure we are not putting an organisation a customer's organization in a position by our guys behaving in a way that is inappropriate for, for them mm, mm. and and um you know i, th I think you know th that's that's a whole other thing as well uh steve and everyone the, the whole thing about ppe and um members might have might have already opened up the email i sent out to everyone uh this morning but uh my attention was drawn to it by an IOD member friend uh, who um, does a lot of import export uh, and um, you know we all have to make um, quite detailed decisions these days we must take nothing for granted because um, everything that we do in connection with our staff and our colleagues safety does carry a heavy um liability tag to it so um you know appropriate appropriate distancing um you know ppe process around how we sort of um interact with colleagues and customers uh, and others uh, i think all of that is going to be um an increasing burden on directors and and business owners in the future I, I see there's 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 quite a lot of conversation and some detailed um, sort of um, information around um, air condition systems and um, whilst an awful lot of that is going to be out of the control of individual um, um, sort of office uh, renters or leaseholders um, I am aware speaking to uh, some uh, some colleagues and some friends that um, there is talk and I, I'll bow to other people's expertise here but there is talk at the moment about um, the uh, having to maybe increase the airflow uh, from air condition installations because uh, the standard air condition airflow uh, for an office um, could be three or four sort of um, sort of refreshes an hour uh, whereas um, in uh, laboratories, it's up to six or eight refreshes an hour. And there is some talk, I understand, in the property world and in the, in, in the sort of um, um, mechanical, electrical um, sort of installations world um, that maybe existing air conditioning systems might have to be ramped up as well uh, to provide a COVID safer uh, environment. So... I know we have some people who are talking about that um, in the chat and maybe that might be something along with other air, other areas of coming back to the office that we might want to have another sort of IOD connect on uh, because, um, you know, that could be very, very um, interesting to, to others. I'm aware that we're coming up to, um, to, to uh, two o'clock. So um, I think, 
it's probably unless there's anybody who's got a final sort of um, desperate question. I can't see there's anything sort of desperate on the um, on the question. Stephen, look, you yeah. look as though you're going to say something. Yeah. I, so my my business does uh, space planning, interior design, fit out of commercial offices. I, I've just uploaded um, something from Knight Frank uh, uh, that was distributed on a webcast last week, and a number of the the global uh, corporate real estate guys have done different things, Colliers, uh, Cushman and Wakefield. So it, it is a bit subjective, but Knight Franks is very good. It's about reoccupancy, reimagining how the office space would look. So it's a bit of research there, so it's worth doing that. I've just uploaded that and distributed it. Uh, okay. the, the subject on air conditioning is very subjective because it does come down to the type of building itself. But yes, I've heard that as well in terms of uh, increasing the uh, the distribution of fresh air throughout the building but it's yeah. entirely subjective very difficult and landlords have to look at that in some shape or form but quite frankly wear a pair of gloves don't press the lift button <laughs> don't press the lift button alexa get me that lift <laughs> I'll, I'll i'll attach that to my to my sort of email after that uh, after this meeting uh stephen thank you very much indeed no worries um, meanwhile if anybody Things so that that might be useful, then just click on it and download it before the meeting closes. So um, with, with that, I think um, all that remains for me to do is to say uh, thank you very, very much, Steve, for sharing some of that information with us. And thank you, everyone, for your, uh, your questions and your engagement. Uh, our next um, event in this mini-series is Michelle Tudor from uh, Moore Barlow. And... She's going to be taking us through some of the um, some of the legal sort of um, implications as they currently stand um, in connection with returning <laughs> to the workplace. So if that's something that might be useful to you, then I urge you to book onto that. I think we're getting up to close to the max on that. I think we're up to about 40 odd people on that and we're maxing it out at 50. Um, and then our 859 Mindshare at the end of the month. Um, we're extending it again, so it's 7.45 to 8.59. Um, we will see the return of the 4x4, four four, but we're going to be sort of just sharing ideas, insights, and inspirations around the whole thing about moving from a, from a sort of a, a profit mindset to a prosperity mindset. And um, if, if this COVID um, crisis has caused anything in the way of thinking, it's been, it has caused um, a greater thinking about community and uh, total participations and mutualities. So I think it's probably a good time to just, just share some ideas um, in the tables, in the rooms uh, on, on how we might, um, how we might um, sort of live with that uh, as a commercial, sustainably commercial sort of reality for us. And um, all that, I need to do now is to urge you please do please please do complete the online evaluation form because uh, it'll help it'll help me certainly uh, to to sort of see how we can improve on this for you um, our members and our business friends in the in the community so uh, with that uh, thank you for your participation thank you for your engagement stay safe stay strong and uh, cheers for now <laughs>